joy God's presence when it moves into a place that touches us. I uh, want God to be able to have His way in each one. Amen. Sometimes that means just slowing down and let God do what He needs to. Amen. And uh, in services, sometimes we just gotta just take some time to say, God. What is it that you're speaking to my heart about right now? And then just say, God, have your way. Amen. And in offering ourselves for God to have his way, I believe that is the truest and purest form of worship. Say, Lord, here I am. Do whatever you need to inside my heart and my life today. And uh, I do want to be able to, with my life, worship him. And uh, if it takes that, then then that's what I will do. I will just say, Lord, help me to step aside so that you can accomplish your will in me. Amen. I do believe that God has got so much for us yet. Right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to remind all of you, we are in a Pentecostal church. That's right. Amen. Amen. We yes. respond to the preaching. That's right. We worship Yes. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. And you say, well, I can do it quietly. Yeah, but the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I, I, would, uh, I would rather uh, be obedient to the Word of God than to my own thoughts and opinions any day. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 It's good to serve God, isn't it? Amen. 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 Somebody came message that God gave me for last week. Wish that kept going for at least another half an hour. And uh, <laughs> why are you all looking so serious? You're thinking I'm going to tell you today I'm going to make up for it, right? <laughs> God is so good. I just enjoy living for God so much. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we're going to read verses 8 through 12 and uh, kind of center in on uh, uh, verse 8 through 12. I hope this is the right scripture. Oh, yes, it is. There we go. Amen. We're going to center in on verse 10. Well, I almost panicked there for a moment. Did I write down the right scripture? Uh, pull up behind me. For those of you that don't have your Bible. It says, finally, be ye all of one mind and having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Everybody say, I'm pitiful. Uh, that actually means be sympathetic. In case you're wondering, one with another. Uh, Sometimes we apply the word pitiful in areas maybe it shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody is just, I want you to know, God is awesome in our lives. Yeah. We've got no reason to back down, take a back seat, That's feel right. like we're less than nothing. Right. We have the, the king of glory that dwells inside of us. Amen. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I don't have to back down anymore. Or Satan throws at me because I know I can stand up to it. Amen. But in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Be pitiful. Be uh, sympathetic towards others. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. In other words, don't start getting answering back the way somebody may speak to you. Right. So easy, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody speaks harshly to us, we speak harshly back. Man, we get so human in a big hurry instead of being godly. Uh, I better continue on. Well, I can stop and preach all through this passage of scripture. Uh, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but con contrary wise blessing. In other words, if somebody treats you badly, bless them. If somebody says something nasty to you, say something nice. If somebody curses you, bless them. Yeah. <laughs> what are you smiling, Kevin? That's pretty. Just bless them. Yeah. Just bless them. 
Smile at them. Do something nice for them. Holy kids. Amen. Say something nice to them. You'll just blow them off their feet. That's right. They won't know what to do with you. Keep them cold on their heads. Knowing that you are there unto call. In other words, we are called to be a blessing and to bless others, right? Right. Is that what it is? Amen. That ye should also inherit. Hold on a minute. You mean my inheriting a blessing is dependent upon me being a blessing? Right. It sure looks that way according to scripture. Oh, but some of you are looking confused. Isn't that what it said? That's right. Not render evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise, bless people. Knowing that you are there unto call, that you should inherit the blessing. Inherit the blessing also. I like scripture. Doesn't everybody like it? You all love the Bible today? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Amen. I like the way it speaks to our hearts. This is actually, I'm just, I'm enjoying this passage of scripture so much that I just actually read all of just this just so I could get to verse 10. Amen. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and let his lips, or and his lips that they speak, no guile, let him eschew evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Don't ever tell me. Don't ever try and convince me that you can do evil and expect that God's going to bless you. Don't ever expect that if you live your life the way you want to and pray, don't expect that God's going to answer your prayer. The Bible says, it says he won't. He hears the prayers of the righteous, not of the unrighteous, not of those that do evil. Right. Everybody said amen. Amen. Again, I'd rather listen to the Bible and obey it and believe it than what anybody or my own spirit has to tell right. Right. So I do want to preach to you today. Half hour, hour, hour and a half, two hours. We'll see how it <laughs> You all know I'm not going to preach for two hours, don't you? But it's a good life. It's a good life. Let's go back to verse 10 and just read that again and then we'll pray. For he that will love life and see good days. And all the rest of what we read, all it has to do with that principle. Right. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I just love you so much. I thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you... God, I am amazed over and over again how patient, Lord, how long-suffering you are towards each one of us. God, you, it just seems, Lord, that, that no matter how bad we may get, how many times we fail, Lord, if we will just turn our face back towards you again, you're right there to help us to get on our feet. To help us, Lord, and the scripture comes to mind that you began as such a work in us. God, that as long as our hearts are towards you, you will be faithful to completing. Lord, you're not going to give up on us as long as there's something yet inside of us that seeks for you to work in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for that. God, help us to realize that, that anything that would tell us that living for you is not good. God, help us never to believe the lies that this world would have us believe or that Satan would have us to believe that any of those things are true because living for you is the very best life. It's the very best life that we can live. So Lord, I pray that you'll help me to step aside today and allow your words to come forth, Lord. I pray, God, that you will touch those that are here. Jesus, touch their hearts and their minds, touch their spirits, help them, Lord, to draw closer to you, become more like you, Lord, desire you with a greater desire in their hearts today. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Shake hands with your neighbor and say it's a good life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you may be seated. What constitutes, I, I just at the beginning of, of having God kind of speak to me about this message, I asked the question of, of myself, and I'm, I'm kind of just trying to get an idea. What constitutes a good life? Think about it. What to you would, would 
would make you think that you had lived a good life. I've often attended uh, funerals. Sometimes I've been a participant in them. Sometimes I've had to uh, to oversee those times. And I'm always quite amazed at what is said about those that have passed away. And uh, it seems like at that point in time that there doesn't seem to be much that that individual did that was wrong in their lives. Yeah. And yet I, I oftentimes I'll sit back and I'll think about it within myself. What was their life? What did it all entail? Was it a good life? Was it really everything? And I'm glad that we say and see good things about people at that time in their lives. But not everybody is going to heaven. That's right. That's right. Not everybody has led a godly life. Yeah. And the Bible very plainly shows us and tells us that there is going to be two destinations and two only. That's There's right. no holding place. That's right. There's no place in between. There is either heaven or there is a place of punishment. And we will choose through this That's life right. in which place that we will spend eternity. Right. I do have an eternal soul. Amen. Everybody say, I have an eternal soul. If I should pass away during this message or at the end of this day, my eternal soul is going to go onward to one place or the other. That's right. Everybody said amen. Yeah. Yeah. And so in choosing God, I want you to know that, that I looked at this and I, I looked at what constitutes a good life. And I thought about the fact that I can go into all of the things that God has done in my life. And I really appreciate what God's done. I appreciate His salvation yeah. today. Amen. I appreciate the fact that my sins are washed away. Amen. And that he died on the cross, as, as Brother Ken was talking about, so that my sins could be gone and I could be purified and I could be clean. I'm so glad today that he gave me the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. For it is power in my life. I have resistance to, to the things that would tempt me and the things that would draw me away from God by the power of the Holy Ghost. Anything good from it. That's right. That's the fact right. is, I would say of all the people that I know, of those 
folks that have left God, there are maybe 50%, maybe less, of the marriages that of those people that are still together now that before they left, when they were in the church, they were left married. But when they left, man, it, things just fell apart. I don't understand it. And not only that, but they started turning back to or went to. And some of these people were raised in the church. They were raised not, not having that as a part of their life. All of a sudden, they feel like getting drunk is good. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like doing drugs and getting high is the way they want to live their lives. Yeah. I'm not quite sure I understand that mentality. How this can replace the awesome yeah. power of the Holy Ghost right. in our lives. Right. In looking at this, I want you know I know I'm a little biased. Yeah. Yeah. I know I am a little prejudiced against that lifestyle because yeah. I came from that's that lifestyle. Right. That's right. I know I'm a little biased in favor of living for God because right. that's the lifestyle I'm in that's now. Right. So you will forgive me if I preach from that bias, will you? Because I think this is the best way to live our lives. Amen. I don't think there's a better way in this world that we can live our lives than the way that we're living and living for God. If you take away all of that and you start looking at it, what, what constitutes having a good life? I look at it, well, first of all, the world tells us that, and, and Satan contributes to that with his contributions in people's lives, that if you have a lot of money, you're going to be happy. And so now we've got a volunteer tax in our country. It's called lotteries. And every person, well, this is, blows me away. People have been asked, this is, what's your retirement plan? Well, my retirement plan is that every, whatever, Wednesday, Thursday, I don't even know, Saturdays, what days do they pull a lottery ticket? I'm going to go buy 20 lottery tickets, and one of these days, I'm going to be a millionaire. Really? That's your plan for retirement? Seriously? Because they have bought into this mentality that money or finances is what's going to make them happy. Did I lose everybody again? No. Can I tell you that it's a lie? There was a fellow that had so much money. His name was Howard Hughes. How many know who Howard Hughes is? He did a uh, documentary movie on him not too long ago, or I don't know how documentary it was or how much fiction it was. But honestly, Howard Hughes had so much money he didn't know what to do with it all. He had airplanes everywhere, and, uh, and he would forget that they were there. And he would hire people to sit and watch his airplane, make sure nobody damaged it, and they would be there for the rest of their lives. And the paychecks would just keep coming. He said, I want to know that man. Yeah, <laughs> There's a retirement plan for you. Here he is, 85-year-old guy, you know, and he's going to work every day, and the paychecks are still coming in. Howard Hughes was so weird. He had so much money. He, he, he was a recluse. He let his hair grow. He wouldn't cut his fingernails or his toenails. I mean, just, he was as strange as strange can be and not happy in his life. And I want you to know that money did not help him to find that satisfaction in life. We've seen people in, just in the past while that have passed away that had so much money. Uh, Michael Jackson, uh, Elvis Presley, so many others that, that the money was just coming in. And you know what? It did not satisfy them. That's right. It did not make them happier than what they were before. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think you having money is going to cause you to go to hell unless you choose it to. That's right. That's right. God may choose for you to be rich. Yeah. Praise God.
People, as I mentioned, like Elvis or Michael Jackson or Marilyn Monroe, they had everything going for them. Janis Joplin and so many others uh, that have passed away and taken their own lives in misery and depression and right. discouragement. Right. Finding out that being popular didn't do anything as far as making them happy or causing them to have a good life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people associate and think about the fact that power, if they have authority or if they have position, it's a sad thing that even within the kingdom of God, sometimes we have those that are grasping for position or looking for that title applied to their name as if that's going to make them right. to be a better person or have a better life. Right. And I tell you today that it doesn't matter not one little bit right. what position you have or what title you have. You can have pastor, you can have all these letters and get all the education you want. You can have position politically, you can have position with your peers, but honestly, it's not going to make you any happier that's or right. have a better life. That's right. In fact, this is a saying that says that power corrupts and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. And that sooner or later, the power or the position becomes more important than who you were before you went into that position. That's right, right. That's right. And so I, I don't believe that, that we should believe any of the lies that this world has thrown at us. Number two, I don't think that, that anything that Satan has to say should convince us that, that the life out there is any is better than the life that we have in here. Amen. Amen. Everybody awake out there? Yes. Amen. I don't think that we should be convinced that pleasure is better than joy. Right. The pleasures of this world. The Bible tells us, of course, it says that uh, Demas has forsaken Paul, or Paul said the words, Demas has forsaken me for love of this present he thought that the things of this world would be better for him or help him to find enjoyment more than the enjoyment he found in the kingdom of God. I don't think we should believe that lust is better than love. That's right. right. Fact is, I find that, that when I've looked at that, I find it destroys people's lives rather than adds to the people's lives. Right. That's right. That's right. And yet our world would have us to believe the contrary. The enemy would have us to believe the contrary. The temporary highs of getting drunk or doing drugs or uh, whether they be legal or illegal will replace the satisfaction of having the Holy Ghost in our lives. I don't think we should ever believe that lie. Right. Right. I don't think we should ever believe that any of those things could ever replace or be better than what God wants to do in our lives. That acquiring or having things will bring contentment. To our lives, that if we have enough money, that if we have enough security in this world, that we'll be content. When really the opposite is true, it seems like the more you have, the more you want. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand for a moment, shall we? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, what does constitute a good life? What makes us to believe that living for God and being a part of God's kingdom is is going to be a good life rather than? Uh, the life out there. And you can be seen it. Just had to make sure you're all awake. If you're wondering why I'm in the stand, <laughs> Amen. Hey, man. Somebody should, you should stand behind this pulpit every once in a while. So you can see what I see. Hey, Amen. First of all, what constitutes a good life? And I, I, I thought about this for a while and I thought, you know, the, the most important thing to me is that, that life is not boring. I don't like to be bored. Yeah. Anybody really like boring? No. I know there's a certain amount of, you know, consistency if we have, you know, consistent life, but this is what we do. And I have to tell you this, that, you know, I went to church last Sunday and, and uh, my wife says, well, you know, just, she, we were kind of talking about it and she was saying, well, you don't really have to know yet. I said, this is what I do. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I thought about it for a little while and I thought, you know what? It just, we get caught in, in just having a rut. Right. You know, this is the way we do things. That's right. Yeah. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. You know what? We can get caught into a rut yeah. spiritually. Yeah. Where we come into church and we, we fall asleep in the same old place. Yeah. You know, the pastor's getting up now. You know, now, I can say this about John because he doesn't fall asleep anymore. It's not that I know of. <laughs> but John loved the song service. And I'm sure he still likes music. You know, he's a drummer here, so he likes music. But honestly, you know, it was amazing to me when he was...
was growing up. Right. We'd get through the song service and I'd be behind the pole, but I'd say maybe three words and his head was back and his mouth was open. And he was sound asleep. Now, the, that's not bad when you're a child. Right. right. <laughs> you were a child back then, John. <laughs> but when the adults are doing the same thing, I, I get a little worried then. Because I get thinking, you know what? You guys are just too stuck in. Through this. God, you've got to strengthen me through this. God, you've got to give. 
give me grace through this. God, you've got to help me with the power of the Holy Ghost to forgive, to be able to overcome this. Whatever it may be, God's not going to leave you bored. What you do at those times is going to depend on whether you continue in God. Amen. So what constitutes a good life? What constitutes a good life for me is the variety that God throws at me. And guess what? <laughs> yeah, he throws it at you guys too. Guess what God else God does? He's going to put people around you that are going to challenge your ability to be able to love or forgive. And I'm not talking about people out there. I'm talking about people in here. There are going to be people in your life that God's going to say, you're going to love that one. That's your brother. That's your sister. And you're going to, man, I'm going to over and say, uh-uh. Hard to do, Lord. I don't, don't you love the variety that God gives you? Look around you. Look around you today. Just look at all the people that God has got sitting around you. Pretty diverse group, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Man. God's done such a great job of, of just bringing us all together, putting us in the same body together so that we can serve Him, build a church for Him, worship together, love God together, praise God together. Boy, God does a good job, doesn't He? Everybody say, thank God for my brothers and sisters. I didn't get a lot of amen out of that. <laughs> Woo! Glory. So, I think what constitutes a good life is, is bright. Change. Things that are different. Things that are unusual. And uh, <laughs> I think I may have lost everybody on that one. <laughs> no, you're all with me? All right. Another thing that constitutes a good life and, and uh, is good friends. That's right. Right? Yeah. Everybody say good friends. Yeah. You know what I found about people in the church? That even though our personalities may clash, even though we may not see eye to eye on everything that there is, that I know that when I'm in a difficult... You know what I had somebody do because he knew our church was having a hard time financially? One of the ministers over on the mainland says, says, we're, uh, says we've got some extra money in our benevolent fund. He says, uh, we'd like to help you guys out if we could. And I said, you know what? I said, we're going to make it through. God's going to help us to make it through. I says, give it to Brother Perry. But you know what? Where else? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you might find the occasional benevolent person out there that's not looking for God. But you know what? In the church, right. you're going to find all kinds of wonderful and great people that would give of themselves and help you. And I remember a time when there was somebody in this church wasn't able, wasn't going to be able to remortgage their house. And the whole church, all the men and the ladies got together. We painted the house. We roofed it. We lifted it up and left it. Put it in front. You want to know something? I like that about the church. Amen. And we're not doing it for a return from the individual. We're doing it as unto the Lord. And I think that's the awesome part about it. Amen. We're not expecting, okay, I've done it for you. Now you got to come and help me with my house. There's none of that. We're just doing it because we love God and love our brothers and sisters. And I think that's great. Amen. Some people are, and it's a strange thing, you know, people on Facebook that I've got 387 and a half friends. <laughs> really, in reality, they don't have any, those people aren't their friends. Most of the time, they don't even know those people. They just happen to be sharing a, a few little sentences and some, you know, some dialogue on, on uh, social media that doesn't make that person their friend. You know who your friend is? Your friend is somebody that's going to stick by you. They're going to be somebody that will listen to you when you've got problems in your life. And they're not going to judge you, but they're going to say, hey, I want to be able to help you through it. I will be there for you. If all it means is be listening to you, I will be there for you. I got friends today. I don't have acquaintances on Facebook, but I got friends today that will be with me and hang close to me no matter what's going on in my life. And I think that constitutes our prayer, what constitutes having a good life, don't you? Amen. Amen. So I understand. I'm a little biased. I'm doing this hopefully from a, you know, a point of view as somebody who's not living for God, but, but to a certain degree, I'm always going to come to, from the other point. I like it that we have, can have in the church 
if people are living by this word, then our relationships to our spouses, to our children, and to our grandchildren can be what they should be. Amen. 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 I think that in today's modern world, we have found that, that we would rather listen to somebody who's gone to university and gotten a degree in, in all of this, and, and we'll go sit with them, and hopefully they'll be able to help us to, to raise our kids better, to do a better job. Of course, we can't spank them anymore, according to what they say, but yeah, well, we're not supposed to. No, it's not. We got a whole bunch. It was recently in the papers again last week. Uh, a whole bunch of doctors are suggesting that it's the wrong way to do it. Yet my Bible tells me that, that that's something that I need. You know what my daughter did when she taught on Father's Day down there? I listened. I listened to her message at homealife.com, and, and she she was speaking in her church about. Disciplining children. All the children are just listening to me really closely now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell my dad I can spite me? Yeah. Yes. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, my dad always, you know, he gave us, you know, when we, it was time, you know, and, and usually, you know, I think the, the punishment should, should right. be appropriate to the crime, right? Yeah. That's right. Do you think so? Yeah. There's times a timeout is the best way. With Amy, you could never give her a timeout. Because she loved her timeouts. <laughs> How is that a punishment? Yeah. You know? And she'd go in there and read, and she was just happy. She says, your time's up. No, I'm, I'm going to stay a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking books away or something. I don't know. And she says, my dad would always give us, you know, two choices. If you fight me, you get three. When you don't, you get to. And that was it. And uh, and she talked about that. And you want to know something? I, you know, I promised myself that I was, when I was first married, that when we had children, I was never going to discipline them in anger. But I'm so glad that God's Word gives us the right way, the biblical way, the godly way of doing it. We have a whole generation growing up without any restraints. Without any knowledge of right and wrong, because uh, they've never had to deal with the consequences of wrong. Yeah. Everybody say amen. amen. I'm glad that I can have a relationship with my children, uh, a good relationship with my children and with my grandchildren. Yeah, right. gonna, I've got this this one portion. It says, and it's long. What is what does all your titles say on my phone? It's like three sentences long, your favorite, you know, and so forth and so on. And so every once in a while, I get a text from Kyle. You know what? That's awesome. Right. We're going last weekend when we went down to the lake and we're laying there, and Tony's asking us about God and about heaven and about the way that God. Isn't that awesome? Amen. 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 How many people nowadays have that kind of a relationship with their grandchildren and their children? Yeah. You know why it is? Because of an almighty God that changed my life, that changed my wife's life, yeah. that we're able to have. That's a good life. It's a good life. It's nothing to be ashamed about. It's nothing to bow our head about. This is a good life that we live. It is the very best life that we could possibly have. I like it that the Bible talks about contentment. And I know that the world, part of having a good life is being content, right? It is. I mean, so many people are dissatisfied with the way their lives are. Either they don't have an advance far enough in the business, or they don't have enough money, or they don't have their relationship is having problems. Let me tell you something. Every relationship has its problems. It's only how we deal with them that makes a difference as to whether that relationship is going to succeed or not. Amen. And the Bible tells us, and God helps us to understand how to have that type of relationship, how to deal with conflict. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anyway, contentment. Paul said it this way. I have found that whatever, in whatever state I find myself, there will be content. Whether I'm in the middle of a struggle or a trial or everything's going well, I'm content. Whether I have money or I have none, I'm content. Whether or not everybody believes me or doesn't believe me, I'm still content. 
whether I'm pastoring a church of a thousands or whether it's a woman by the side of a river somewhere that I've spoken to. I'm content. We base our contentment so much on the things that we see around us or the things that we have that most of the time we spend our lives being discontent with our lives. Discontent with our paychecks. Discontent with our jobs. Discontent with governments. And discontent with... I mean, I'm telling you, if you listen to people about all the things they're discontent about, I want you to know there's a whole world of discontentment out there. But not in this kingdom. In living for God, there is a contentment to know that the things that God would have you to have are the things that God wanted you to have, and they're the things that are the best for you. Boy, that's such a simple philosophy, isn't it? That right now, where I am right now, where you are right now, this is this is exactly where God knew you would be. This is exactly where God wanted you to be. The things that, that you have encountered, you say, well, what about bad things? What about sinful things? You know what? I, sin's not the will of God. But you know something? Even in all of that, if your heart is towards Him, that all things will work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Keep loving God. Yeah. Keep loving God. Don't give up on loving God. Don't give up on serving God. And I'll tell you, all those things that happen in your lives, whether good or bad, God's going to cause a good result to come from them. Hallelujah. Boy, I like that. Don't you? The Bible tells us in, uh, let me see, I think it's Galatians, it says, This life that I live, I live by faith. And I think it's in Jesus Christ, if I'm quoting it correctly. Thank you. This life that I live, I live by faith in Him. Not in my abilities, not in my strength, not in my intellect, not in my willpower, not in the strength. Stand together, shall we? Yeah. Hallelujah. This life that I now live in the flesh. I miss that part, did not The last one that I wanted to get to have the musicians come. Is joyfulness. Everybody say joyfulness. Everybody smile. That smile. Seriously? <laughs> Joyfulness. Yeah, I know the Constitution of the United States says that, uh, you know, it goes through all their rights, uh, you know, the, the, how, how do they put it? Uh, oh, that's it. Pursuit of happiness. Thank you, Paul. Pursuit of happiness. Gives everybody the right to pursue happiness. Right? Now, some of you may have seen the movie with Will Smith or whatever, you know, Pursuit of Happiness. You ever notice that the movie was all based on his happiness, was based on how much money he made? It was never based on his circumstances where he was. It was based on the amount of money that he was going to have. That is the way that America, Canada, civilized worlds nowadays determine whether or not they're going to have happiness. How much they made, the amount of the paper. Comparisons. Even with the Nickel Brothers, it's amazing, you know, that everybody's looking at the current paychecks. How much you make? How much you make? And the first thing that happened to me when I went over there, the very first week, is I had people come and ask me for a raise. <laughs> like, I'm just a temporary supervisor here, you know? I'm just here until Tim makes that decision. No. <laughs> or, or somebody else does, you know? This is not my job. Right. And uh, this is, oh, I just find this to you. Yeah, the other person probably said no. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then they sit and they'll look at it and they'll do their best, you know, sneakily to try and find out how much that other person is making. Just so they can possibly just make a little bit more ask. Well, this person's making this much, so I should be making this much. Yeah. And you ever notice that's how it works? Yeah. Soon it happens. I like what the Bible says. You know what? I have found joy in the most unusual and adverse of circumstances. 
just by looking around and seeing all the things that God has skilled me. Peter called it having this Holy Ghost and living for God. Joy unspeakable over the full of the Lord. Woo! Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. That's what this life is. It's joy unspeakable, full of glory. It's not pursuing after happiness by hoping to get a bigger paycheck. Right. But it is, as the Word of God says in Romans, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what this kingdom is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I enjoy you for God. I enjoy all of you. I think it's great that God placed us all together. I just love it that God did. Look at all of you. I smile. Talk with that person. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome that God would do that? Whether it's Kelly or Terry or Jessica or Paul, whoever it may be, Elaine and Leroy, Mark and Ray, whoever it may be, I am so joyful that God placed you in my life. Intentionally and on purpose. What an awesome God to serve. To me, these five things that I've listed. And I can keep going. Constitute, at least for me, what it means to have a good life. And maybe, maybe that's all we need. Just to have the Holy Ghost in our lives. Maybe there's really no need for us to be so scrambling after so many other things. <clears throat> but just have God in our lives. Amen. And I was going to end this with, with that part, but I wanted to leave it just with the things that we can look at and say that would make it worthwhile. Just having that kind of joy in my life makes it worthwhile. Just having that kind of content in my life makes it that worthwhile. Just having that knowledge that my relationship with my wife, my children, my grandchildren, God ordained this is the way that it's been. My wife and I are going on a holiday starting this coming week. Celebrate our 40th anniversary. But really, I was telling somebody that I worked with the other day that I've known her and gone up with her since she was 14 years old. And isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome that we could celebrate our people look at that? Huh? That's awesome. I don't think we would have had that happen if we had not been in the kingdom of God. But I'm glad that God has done that. And in front of all of you, I want you to know that this is the only person that I would want to spend the rest of my life with. I told her, so you know, I told her before we were married, she asked me, what do you want from life? And I said, I want to marry you. I want to have children together. I want to have lots and lots of grandchildren, and at the end of our lives, I want to be sitting on a patio, holding hands, and saying, "Look at all that God has out for us." Right. This is a good life, yeah. the very best of lives, better than any lie that the enemy could tell you that's out there that you may think that it's better. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. If you want to come and talk to God for a while, come and worship for a while, this altar is open. If you would just like to say, God, I want that kind of life for myself, then this altar is open for you to come and pray. And speak to God, because God wants to give you a good life. Hallelujah. This altar is open.